All right, welcome everybody and uh, thanks for joining me in our webinar today where, as the title shows, we're going to be talking about BGP path attributes. So let's just jump right into it here. Uh, if you've never seen me before, seen any of my videos or my webinars, here's some information for me. You can see I've got my email address, my Twitter handle and LinkedIn account. So after this webinar is done, if you have any subsequent questions or you, know, you just need any other help in your pursuits of certifications, I'm here for you, so feel free to reach out for me. Okay, so there are just uh, some prerequisites to make sure that you understand the concepts I'm gonna talk about today. Clearly, BGP is probably one of the most complex routing protocols. And you know we're not gonna cover all the gory details of how it works, and quite frankly, even with roughly between 60 and 90 minutes, even that's pretty tight just to talk about path attributes by themselves. So we're going to cram as many path attributes as we can into this discussion, and I'm going to demonstrate all of them for you as well, so you can see how they work. But in order to understand this stuff, number one, you do need to have an understanding of basic IP packet routing concepts. If the whole concept of routing is foreign to you, mm, probably should watch the recording of this after you watch some basic routing videos first. Uh, also, a basic understanding of the BGP peering process. And what I mean by that is, I'm gonna start with a topology, and Brittany has already a few times included the link to that topology in the, the chat window for you, so you can follow along as I'm doing my demonstrations. And in my topology, the basics of BGP is already set up. The routers have already got BGP running. They're already paired with each other. I've got my eBGP and my iBGP peers already good to go because our focus and concentration is not on that. So we're not gonna cover the peering process, so hopefully, you already understand the basics of how we get two routers to talk to each other via BGP in the first place. And then lastly, uh, I would hope that you'd have a, a high level knowledge of the differences between IBGP and eBGP. You know, for example, right? If, uh, if I'm a router and you're a router, my famous phrase right there, okay? And, and let's say that we are eBGP peers, you're in one autonomous system, I'm in a completely different autonomous system. If I send you a BGP update with a bunch of routes in it, well, because you received that from an external peer, you can turn around and send that update to all the other peers you have. However, if you and I are IBGP peers, if we're both in the same autonomous system, and now I send you an update, well, there's a different rule set that gets invoked there. So now once you've received that update from me, because it's an IBGP update, you can send it to any external peers you've got, but you cannot turn around and send it to any other internal peers you have. So that's just like one example of some of the high level differences between IBGP and eBGP, which I, I hope you will know going into this. All right, so let's just go right into here. So let's start out with this high level question of what is a path attribute? You know, it's, it's a fundamental component of BGP and it's a component within the BGP update message. So, you know, all routing protocols have different messages, different types of packets they use to accomplish different objectives. In the case of BGP, if I wanna send you some new prefixes or I wanna send you some prefixes that have gone away, I wanna say, hey, these prefixes I previously told you about, they're gone, can't get there anymore. I use a, a packet called a BGP update message for that. And the way the BGP update packet is constructed is that at the very bottom of the update packet is where you actually have what we call the prefix. You might call that the route but technically we call that the BGP prefix, you know, 10, 10, 10, 0 slash 24, the prefix and the length. And then above that, we have all these descriptive attributes of that prefix, which we call path attributes. So path attributes basically describe the properties or attributes of one or more prefixes. And path attributes can be used for a variety of things. For example, some path attributes are used in the best path selection process. What that means is if I'm a BGP speaker and I have two peers and they both advertise to me the exact same prefix, the exact same route, I need to figure out which one is best. That's the one I'm gonna put in my own routing table and that's the one I'm gonna forward on downstream to other peers that I have. Well, some of these path attributes help me to select which of those two prefixes is the best one to install on my table and to advertise on. Other BGP path attributes are used for loop prevention. You know, is this a route that already went through my autonomous system, left, and then circled back around and is coming back in again? Well, there's path attributes that can be used to determine that. 
Some path attributes are used primarily for prefix classification and for further processing. For example, if you know a little bit about routing, you know, if you study anything with like EIGRP or OSPF, you probably learned this concept of route tags. Or route tag is just an artificial number you can stick in a routing update. You can make it whatever you want. The route tag could be 70, 8888, whatever. And then another router downstream can match on that tag. Now, once he matches on that tag, it's his choice what he wants to do with it. A router downstream might say, oh, well, if I see any route with a tag of 8888, I'm going to filter that with a distribute list. Or maybe if I see a route with 888, I'm going to modify it or change it in some way. So a route tag is just a, a classification tool. It doesn't really do anything to the route. It's not used to figure out which route is the best. It's just used to lock onto a particular route and say, oh, there it is. That's what I'm looking for. And now you can do something. Well, the same thing exists in BGP. For example, there's these BGP communities called uh, BGP path attributes called communities. And communities are just that. They are a, a number you can stick in a BGP update that can be used for classification purposes. And some BGP attributes are, or path attributes are really just sort of purely informative. You can't really do anything with them. They're just there for you as the network administrator to say, oh, okay, now that I see that particular variable, that path attribute in the route, that tells me something about the route. For example, there's one called the atomic aggregate path attribute that you can't really filter it out, you can't really do anything with it, but when you see the atomic aggregate path attribute within an update, within a prefix, that tells you, oh, this particular route is a summarized route. And I don't know the specifics. Some of the specifics of the route have been lost. So the specifics of the, like the subnets that I'm not seeing that were summarized, those have been lost to me. And that's what that atomic aggregate is telling me. So it's not really something I use for filtering or best path selection. It's just informative. And then a lot of these attributes can be used for multiple things. They're not just one or the other. Some of these attributes can be used for two or even three of these purposes here. Okay, so the next thing you need to know is that path attributes in general fall into one of four different categories. Now, before I show you the categories, you might be thinking, well, okay, why do I care? Why do I care what the category is? Well, there's a couple of big reasons why you'd wanna know this. Let's say that you're Googling a particular path attribute. You know, you read in some book or some paper somewhere about some path attribute you've never heard of. You Google it, and it tells you that it's one of these four categories that I'm about to show you. Well, knowing the category will answer questions like, okay, number one, is this a path attribute that, that might be just proprietary to this particular vendor? Maybe it's something that their routers and switches doing BGP understand, but other devices don't. Well, one of these four categories would help you to answer that question. Another question would be, okay, is this a path attribute that if I'm gonna use it, is only meant to stay within an autonomous system? It's, it's meant to influence BGP peers within an autonomous system, but it can't be sent to another autonomous system. Some of these categories will answer that question too. So let's just look right at these. So number one, we have the well-known mandatory path attributes. So well-known means these path attributes, any device that's capable of speaking BGP, anything, no matter who made it, has to understand this path attribute. There's an RFC for it, it's clearly defined, it is just part of the basic BGP code. And mandatory meaning that when a router sends a BGP update, it has to include these well-known mandatory path attributes. There's only three of them, and we'll look at those. It's the next hop, the AS path, and the origin code. We'll look at all three of those, but those have to be in every BGP update. And every BGP speaker, no matter who made it, will understand what those things are. Then we have well-known discretionary. Once again, well-known meaning, hey, every router, every device out there that speaks BGP will understand this, but it's discretionary. As you as a network administrator, it's up to you whether or not you wanna use this thing. You might not have any use for it. Then we have the optional path attributes. Now optional right there says, okay, no guarantees that every vendor's equipment is gonna understand this path attribute. So there's some path attributes that fall in the optional category that yeah, pretty much every device knows what it is. You know, it, it's been out there long enough that it's pretty ubiquitous, every device knows. But then there's other path attributes that maybe only Cisco devices or maybe only Juniper devices can actually understand because it's proprietary to them. So optional means 
that. It may or may not be understood. Transitive means that this is a path attribute that is allowed to go from one autonomous system to another. Okay, so it can, it can go multiple autonomous systems deep. Um, now, also another characteristic of an optional path attribute you have to ask yourself is, okay, if I'm a BGP router and I receive a BGP update that's got one or more prefixes in it, and I see one of these optional attributes in there, but I don't know what it is. So I'm looking at this BGP update and say, hmm, right here, these bytes is normally where a path attribute would be, but the numbers in there, I, I have no idea what that's telling me. Okay, so this is an example of you received an optional path attribute and you have no idea what it is. So then here's the next question. Okay, if that happens, one of two things can occur. Okay, so number one, the question is, are you allowed to even look at the rest of that update? If I get in a BGP update and there's a path attribute in there, I don't know what it is, should I just discard that whole update and say, okay, the rest of it, the 99% I do understand, psh, forget about it, because there's this one little piece in here I don't. Or, you know, can I use it and just ignore that little slice? The second question is, okay, if something comes in that I don't understand, let's say I decide, well, I, I'm gonna go ahead and use this update anyway, even though I don't understand this piece. The next question is, okay, now when I turn around and I send that prefix to somebody else, should I still include that path attribute in there that I don't understand, thinking that, well, maybe somebody else will, even though I don't? Or should I just forward the update to them and strip that little piece out? Because if I didn't understand it, eh, probably nobody else will either. So in the case of an optional transitive attribute, if you receive a BGP update and you don't understand that particular field, the rules say, hey, look, you can still use that update, you can still use that prefix, put it in your BGP table, just pretend like that field wasn't even there. Pretend like you didn't even see it. And you can forward it on to another peer. Just, you know, leave that part out, basically. And then there is the optional non-transitive. So once again, optional meaning there may or may not be an RFC for this, it might be proprietary. And non-transitive means, okay, when you get it from a peer, it cannot leave your autonomous system, okay? It has to stay within your autonomous system. You can't send it to another external peer. Okay, so as I mentioned, these path attributes that we're gonna get into can serve a variety of purposes. The main thing that people use path attributes for is the best path selection process. Once again, meaning I've received two or three or four updates, all contain the exact same route, you know, the 70, 70, 70 route, now I need to figure out which one is best. And so most of the time we think of path attributes in that context, answering that question, which prefix is best. All right, so now I'm gonna show you the best path selection process. At the moment, if you don't have any familiarity with path attributes, a lot of this stuff is probably not gonna make a lot of sense to you, but we'll come back to this as we look at this. So the order is this, number one, the next hop of the BGP route has to be reachable. If I send you a BGP update, okay, let's say I am 1111. So you know me, you know how to get to me because we're peers. But if I send you a BGP update and I say, hey, here's the prefix of the 90 network and the next hop is 125.777. So it's not me, even though I'm sending it to you, I'm giving you a different next hop. If you don't know how to get to that next hop that I'm advertising, it's done. All bets are off. You, you will put that update in your BGP table but you cannot install it in your routing table. You can't pass it on to anybody else because the next hop is inaccessible. So you need to be able to get to that next hop. Now let's assume that's not a problem. The next hop, you know where it is, you know how to get there, we're good. Okay, now we start looking at some of these path attributes. So the first one we're gonna look at is weight. Now this one's a little bit weird because weight is a Cisco proprietary thing. Okay, so this would fall in the optional category of path attributes. And what makes it weird is that it's not actually in the BGP update anywhere. If you're familiar with routing protocols and, and routing on Cisco routers, you've probably heard of something called administrative distance, right? So Cisco routers and, and other non-Cisco stuff has a similar concept, which is that a router could learn about routes via lots of different ways, right? Connected, static, OSPF, and, and administrative distance is a value that sort of ranks and sorts all the ways you could learn of a route. 
right? The lower the administrative distance of a particular routing method, the more preferred it is. But administrative distance is just something that's local to your own router. I can't take my administrative distance value and push it to you. There's no message type that I can use to tell you what my administrative distance value is. It's locally significant only to me. That's like weight. Weight, even though we call it a path attribute and it sort of falls into this process here, it's like administrative distance. It's locally significant. It's only used on a router that's locally programmed to use it. It cannot be transported between routers. But this is at the top of the food chain. The very first thing that's considered is weight. And if I have, if I have two neighbors, that send me the exact same prefix. They both send me like the 90.90 .90 network. And I've locally configured saying, hey, anything I get from that neighbor right there, I'm gonna give him a weight of five. Anything I receive from that neighbor over there, I'm gonna give a weight of one. Well, the higher weight is preferred. So anytime I get the redundant routes from these two guys, if I'm automatically giving this guy here a higher weight than this guy, I will prefer him. And neither one of those guys know that. They have no idea I'm using weight. That's just something I've configured on myself. And we'll look at how to configure that. Then we drop down to local preference. So if, there, if weight is not a factor, if they're all identical, then the highest local preference is preferred, followed by locally originated routes, and then the AS path link. I'm just gonna sort of go through these really, really fast and we're gonna demonstrate them. And I'll, I'll come back to this. And then we go to the origin code. So, um, Routes that were learned with an origin code of IGP, which is typically in Cisco world, routes that were originated using the network command in BGP are preferred over routes with an origin code of incomplete, which are routes that were originated with the redistribute command. And then we keep going. Uh, the smallest met is preferred. EBGP neighbors are preferred over IBGP neighbors. Um, this next one here only uh, refers to IBGP neighbors so if, you know, one of the things about the BGP that's kind of unique from other routing protocols is that with BGP, I could have a peering relationship with a router who's not even physically connected to me. There could be a router that's like two or three routers away from me. I got two or three routers in the middle and I could still form a BGP peering connection with him. So imagine the scenario where in my autonomous system, that's what's going on. I've got some neighbors that I'm connected to, other neighbors are like multiple hops away. And so you have to ask yourself, okay, well, how do I get to those neighbors who are multiple hops away? Well, I'm using some kind of IGP routing protocol. I've learned about those neighbors via OSPF or EIGRP or RIP. And using my IGP routing protocol, BGP now knows, oh, I know how to get to that neighbor of 7777. Even though he's not connected to any of my interfaces, OSPF has told me how to reach 777 or EIGRP has. But once again, in this scenario here, if I have a couple of IBGP neighbors, let's say neighbor one and neighbor two, neither one of them is connected to me. Neighbor one is like, let's use RIP as an example. Neighbor one is four RIP hops away. Neighbor two is seven RIP hops away. So I'm peered with both of them. If they both send me the exact same prefix, and I've already gone through all this other stuff and everything is e weight is equal, local preference is equal, this is equal, this is equal, and now I get down to this, I'll say, oh, well, neighbor one is four hop counts away, neighbor two is seven hop counts away, smallest IGP metric wins, so I'll prefer the route from neighbor one because he's closer to me. Now, if that's both the same, we keep going on. Then, if you learned about the route from an EBG neighbor, it's whichever one came in first. Whichever neighbor sent you the route first, that's the winner. Now, at this point, we start getting kind of weird because, okay, let's say I got routes from two neighbors at exactly the same time. We got to keep going then. Then it's the lowest neighbor's BGP router ID, followed by the lowest neighbor IP address. So you can see, as we go through this best path selection process, if I do receive the exact same prefix from two or more neighbors, eventually, as I go through this process, I will find something that's different that will enable me to say, that's the best neighbor, that is the best route, that's the one I'm gonna put in my routing table. Now, as far as we go through this process here, what path attributes assist us in this process? And I put little gray boxes around here. So in the N Willa Omni Ol, <laughs> try to memorize that, but in that best path selection process, the W and the L, 
the A and the O and the M, those are all things that are carried by BGP path attributes. The other stuff is not. And like I said, even though we call weight a path attribute, it's not carried in an update. So let's go ahead and demonstrate all this stuff. And I'll just go ahead and use that N will omni all to sort of go through this. All right, so here is our topology. And once again, you guys should all have a link to this so you can download a PDF of this topology. I've already got this pre-built right here. And let's see how this works. Also, uh, I'm gonna uh, open up Wireshark as well so we can see the update and we can actually see the path attributes inside that update, which is kind of fun. All right, so it's gonna be on this interface right here. And we'll just do a filter on BGP. So we'll filter on port 179 so we don't have to see all this other garbage. All right. Okay, so, uh, so let's start with N, next hop, okay? So at the moment, right now, CSR1, so everything inside here, inside AS134, is running OSPF. And the way I've currently got it configured is that the routers that have external connections, like CSR1, he's using redistribution to redistribute these external connections into OSPF. Right? And, and the same thing is happening with router four. He's redistributing the 4242 network. So in order to demonstrate next hop reachability, here's what I'm simply gonna do. I'm gonna go on a CSR1 and I'm gonna turn off redistribution. So by turning it off, that will mean that router three and router four will have no way of knowing where the 111111 or the 21, 20, 20, 20, 21 networks are. They won't know about it, all right? so. Let's go to CSR1 now real quick and do that. CSR1, there we are. So router OSPF1, no redistribute connected subnets. All right, so to prove this, now we're gonna go to router three and we're gonna see if router three knows about the 111.11 or the 21.21.21. He should not know about those networks. Okay, yep, the 11 network is gone, the 21 network is gone. Okay, so that's gone now. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna move our focus here over to router one. And one of router one's loopback interfaces is the 12, 12, 12 network right here on loopback zero. So I'm gonna tell router one to advertise that 12, 12, 12 network downstream to CSR one. <clears throat> now this is gonna come in as an external BGP update. So what that means is when router one advertises it to CSR one, router one's gonna say, hey, the next hop for this network is me, is 11.11.11.1. Now, that's perfectly fine for CSR one because he knows how to get to that next hop. He's directly connected to it. But what we're gonna see now, is when CSR one forwards that update to R3 and R4, because those are considered IBGP updates because he's sending it to IBGP peers, he's gonna leave the next hop alone. He's not gonna change it. So router three and router four are gonna learn of that route still with the 11, 11, 11, one next hop. And they're gonna say, uh, okay, totally useless to me because I have no idea how to get to 11, 11, 11, one. So let's see that in action. All right, so let's go over here to router one. And you can see right now, that my BGP configuration is, is pretty simplistic. Basically just have a couple of neighbor commands and that's it on router one. So here we're gonna go, um, so router BGP autonomous system 12, and we're gonna say, I want you to advertise your loopback, 12, 12, 12, zero, and your mask for that. I have to include that because that's a subnetted route. All right, so CSR1 now, should have learned about it. Show IP route BGP. Okay, so we see he's got that BGP route in his table now. If we dig a little bit deeper into it, show IP BGP and we look for that specific network. 
Okay. Uh, so it says four available. Now, you might say, well, wait a second, four available? How do you get four of them? Well, let's look at our picture again real quickly here. So if we look at our diagram, what happened was router one has a peer with CSR one, so we sent it that way. Router one also has a peering relationship with router two, so then router two got it and advertised it onto CSR one, so that's the second update. Router two also has a peering relationship with CSR two. CSR two got it, advertised it to router three, who sent it to CSR1 and advertised it to router four, who sent it to CSR1. So that's why router CSR1 is saying, hey, I just got this update from four different places. But here's what I wanna, here's the main thing I wanna point out, okay? So let's look at the one that he got directly from router one, here, rather than focusing in on any, any of the other ones. So the one from router one, and by the way, I've made, I've made it easy to figure out where these routes came from because each one of these routers has a distinctive router ID that I, I preset so we could tell. So for example, the router IDs take the form of autonomous system number, autonomous system number, autonomous system number, dot router number. So for example, in 134 here, all these guys have router IDs of 134, 134, 134, this guy would be dot four, this guy would be dot three. This guy here is 12, 12, 12, one. So those are how we can see it. So if we're looking for the route from router one, let's go back to here. All right, so we're looking for the one that came from 12, 12, 12, one. And that would be this one right here, All right? So there's the router ID of where it came from, okay? And notice, this is the next hop. All right, 11, 11, 11, 1. Now for CSR1, that's fine. He's directly connected to that. But the problem is gonna come into play when he forwards that route on to let's say router four. Let's take a look at router four for a moment. Show IP BGP uh, 12, 12, 12, 0 slash 24. Okay, so now we're looking at, we wanna see router four when he received it from CSR1. So here it is right there, right? There's CSR1, 134, 134.1. .1. He advertised it saying, hey, that route has a next hop of 11.11.1, and router four saying, mm, inaccessible. I have no idea how to get there. I can't use that. So that particular entry cannot go any further, cannot be considered for routing in the routing table because it is inaccessible. So that's how the next hop works, and we could actually see that in the BGP, uh, let's see here, in the, um, let's see here, in the Wireshark, if I can sort of put everything on here so we got enough room, there we go. All right, so back when that update came, here it is right here, here's an example of one of them. Hopefully you guys can see that. Let's see here, there might be a way here I can make this zoom in here. So zoom is just, uh, let's just zoom in like that, all right. Okay, so here in the BGP update, if we scroll down, we don't care about the TCP, right there, the BGP message. All right, so here down at the bottom is the network itself, network layer reachability information, 12, 12, 12, 0, and above that, all the descriptive path attributes. And what we're looking at right now is next hop, right? So that, that, is, a, that is a mandatory path attribute that must be in there. Now this next hop says 42, 42, 42.22, and uh, so that must be, so if we look at our picture, right? So right now, this is the guy who's doing sniffing. Uh, so next top of 42 must be this one. So we we're seeing the update that came in here that was forwarded by router four. So this guy said, hey, the next top is me, 42, 42.22. And so that's what we're capturing here in Wireshark. But I just wanna show you that, you know, it is a component of the BGP update. If I expand that right there, you know, it's, it's a transitive, well-known update, next hop. And that actually shows us what it is. All right, so that's it for next hop. So now if we go back in that pest path selection process, the next thing was wait, which was a locally significant thing. So now before I continue, let's go back to CSR1 here and let's get that redistribution turned back on. I wanna make sure that everybody knows how to get to his connected networks.
All righty. Okay. So now from this point on, in order to demonstrate the rest of these path attributes, we really need to have at least two routers advertising the exact same route to somebody else. So we can use these path attributes to manipulate which is considered best. And that is why if we look back at our picture here, we can see that on router one and router two, I configured two loopbacks that are both in the exact same subnets, the 12, 12, 12 network and the 12, 21, 21 network. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to router two and I'm just gonna have him also advertise his 12, 12, 12 network. That way CSR one will be getting redundant prefixes from two different peers. So let's go ahead and uh, go to router two here and do that. Router BGP 12 and the same statement I put in the router one. Okay, and just to, um, just to make things a little bit easy, because right now I don't want to take in that long roundabout passer on the bottom there, I am going to, on router two, kill his connection going down over to CSR two. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go into here and type a command into everybody, which is clear IP BGP star, just kill all their neighbor relationships. They'll come back up really quickly though. And because I did that in the bottom of secure CRT, it's sending it to all of my tabs, all of my routers. All right, so let's go to CSR1 now. Okay, looks like his four neighbors are up, that's good. Show IP BGP. All right, so he hasn't learned of that 12 network yet. That's one of the things you'll learn about BGP as you start working with it, that it's, it's not the quickest protocol to propagate things. It sometimes takes a while, but we will get it. It will come in here. Show IP BGP neighbor, include neighbor state. Just make sure all my neighbors are established. And they are, that all looks good there. All right, show IP BGP, should be coming in. That's just, um, it's taken an awful long time. Let's just verify, show IP BGP. Okay, so router one's got in his local BGP table, he's just taking an awful long time to advertise it. And router two has it. Okay, so we should be seeing that in CSR1 here any moment. There we go, it just took a bit. Okay, all right, so let's dig into this a little bit more. Show IP BGP 12, 12, 12, 0 slash 24. All right, so right now we've received it from two neighbors. CSR1 has received it with the next hop of 21, 21, 21.2, so that is his, that's when he got it from router two in the lower right hand corner. He also received it from 11, 11, 11, 1, which is router one in the upper right hand corner. And you can see here it says the best route is number two. Now, if we go through the N will Omni, it, it'd be a little ways down as to why he selected that as number two. But what I wanna focus in on right now is weight. So notice, no mention of weight right here. As a matter of fact, when we looked at it up top here, under the weight category, the weight is zero. All right, so by default, Cisco routers do not assign a weight of anything to a route that they've learned from somebody else, okay? So now let's change that. All right, so let's uh, take a look here. All right, now, in reality, you know, why did he select this one as the best? Well, if we went through that Nwilla Omni best selection process, this actually got down to the oldest eBGP route. Because he already had the route from router one, and then it came in like a, a second or two later from router two, he selected the oldest route, the one he had in his table the longest, as the best route, because everything above that was equal in these two updates. All right, so let's do this. Let's, uh, let's have router CSR1 prefer that route from router two by applying weight. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna create an access list matching on that route. All right, now I'm gonna create a route map that references that ACL.
All right, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the set weight command. And remember, higher weight is more preferred. Now, right now, he's just given a default weight of zero to every route that he's learning from any peer. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna set the weight to one. Okay, one is higher than zero. Next, I'm gonna create another instance of that route map. It just matches on everything else, but doesn't change it, right? Because if I didn't have that second sequence number, as I start advertising more routes, they would be dropped because there wouldn't be another sequence number of my route map to match on those. So it would sort of like act like a filter and I don't want that. All right, so that's that. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go to, let's go back here. So right now he's saying, this is my best route. He's also receiving from here. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna apply my route map against my neighbor of router two. I'm gonna go into CSR one. And I'm gonna say, hey, neighbor 21.21.21.2, whenever you receive anything inbound from him, apply the route map of INE that I just created, which means now when he advertises anything, if it matches that access list, if it matches 12, 12, 12, 0, I will bump up the weight from zero to one. And that should make CSR one always prefer router two because he's got the higher weight. So I've already configured the route map. I've already configured the access list. The only thing left to do on CSR one is to go into my BGP statement my BGP process, if I could type, and say neighbor 21.21.21.2 route dash map INE in. And so what that's gonna do is now, it now one thing about BGP also, if you're not familiar with it, is that when you apply policy like this, a new policy or you're changing your existing policy, it does not take effect on the routes you currently have in your routing table and your BGP table. Your route policy applications or changes only take effect if something new is coming in or something new is going out. And so we'll see that, right? I'm gonna apply it here to my neighbor inbound statement. Okay, here, but you know, router two has no reason to resend the route to me right now. So if I do show IP BGP, notice my weight is still zero. My route map has not taken effect. So I need to get router two to resend that route to CSR one so I can now run it through my new route map and actually make that change. So for that, I'm actually gonna use the route refresh feature. I'm gonna say clear IP BGP, I'll say star in. And what that's gonna do is now CSR one is gonna send the special BGP message. We'll see it inside the, the Wireshark called a route refresh message out to all of his peers and say, hey, can you please resend to me all of your routes again? And because they support route refresh, that's a, that's a standard thing that Cisco routers support, they will do it. All right, so let's go ahead and there it goes. So we don't see anything in the background, but if we look in our sniffer trace, right there, route refresh message. So type route refresh, and he's saying, hey, you know, I want uh, unicast routes. Can you please resend your unicast routes to me again? And we should see, I don't know why we don't see uh, another BGP update in here. It might just not have been caught, but let's see here. Show IP BGP. Okay, now it worked. Because now we can see that the 12.12.12 network was received from router two, and this time the weight is one. And this little uh, greater than sign right there that means that is the best route because we have two paths to that route. The greater than sign means that's the one I'm preferring as the best route because it has the higher weight. Okay. Now, like I said, weight is not carried on to anybody else. So if we go uh, further on downstream, for example, to router three, show IP BGP, his weight is still zero, right? Because we haven't configured weight on him. So that's a locally significant value. Okay, so uh, that's weight. Now let's say that I receive two of the exact same route from two peers and the next hop is reachable. The weight is the same, maybe they're both zero. The next thing I look at is something called local preference. Now local preference, if I receive a route from an external peer, 
local preference is not in there. Local preference, if, if you're going to put the local preference path attribute into a BGP update, if you're going to put it in there, you can only do that when you're sending that update to an internal peer. So one internal peer can advertise local preference to another internal peer, but that is not a transitive attribute. So it cannot go from one autonomous system to another. It's used to influence your local autonomous system. So for example, um, let's see here. So here's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna reinstitute this link down here. And what we're gonna see once I do that, is that, let's just look on router three, for example. He's gonna learn about that 12, 12, 12 network from this direction. He's gonna learn about from CSR one. Uh, he's gonna learn about directly from CSR two. And there's also a very good chance that he'll learn about it from an IBGP neighbor of router four. So he'll learn about from three different directions. Now I can use local preference to influence which path router three chooses to get to that 12, 12, 12, zero network. Now, when CSR2 sends that update to router three, so when CSR2 does it, that is an external update. That's an EBGB update. CSR2 cannot send local preference in that update, but he can get it from CSR1 and router four. Now you might say, okay, well, you know, if, uh, if my ultimate objective is I want router three to go this way for the 12, 12, 12 network, and I wanna use local preference to influence that. But Keith, you're telling me that CSR2 can't send him local preference. Well, then how can I use that path attribute? Well, when a router learns of a BGP update, okay, the default behavior is this. When the update comes in, if it comes in from an IBGP peer, by default, there will already be a local preference in there of 100. 100 is the default value for local preference. So even if I do nothing, we will see that this update that comes in this way and this update that comes in this way will both have local preference values of 100. That CSR1 and router four already applied without me doing anything. Now, the other default behavior is if you receive an EBGB update from an external peer, yes, it's true, there's no local preference in there, but you apply it yourself. So we'll actually see that router three, even though he did not receive local preference from CSR2, when he says, oh, this is an external update, well, when I put it in my own BGB table, I will put local preference of 100 in there. Even though I didn't learn it from that guy, I will apply it myself. And here's how you can visualize that. So let's go ahead and bring up that link now between router two and CSR one to make sure that happens. So router two right there. So interface gig zero, zero, no shut. All right, and then we gotta wait for the BGP peering to start up. Let's go over to uh, CSR two and wait for him to get it. Okay, so the neighbor is up, show IP BGP 12, 12, 12, zero slash 24. All right, and see here, 12, 12, 12, yes. So right there, that very first one, this one, because look, here's the router ID, right? So he learned that directly from 12, 12, 12, two, and that is router two, okay. And here's actually a classic example of this. Let's, you know, look in router, uh, look in, in CSR two right now. He's at the very far left of the topology. If I do show IP BGP, Okay, notice that the local preference column has nothing in it. And that's because that column is only populated when you learn local preference from somebody else. Well, the only peers that CSR2 has is external peers. He's never gonna learn local preference from them. So that is zero, but we can see here, if I scroll up a little bit, inside the guts of that route, inside the BGP table, he actually assigned a local preference of 100 himself to those routes. So if later on I added an IBGB peer to autonomous system number two, CSR2 could forward that local preference to them that he put in himself. All right, so let's just go ahead and use local preference now uh, to influence our, our routes. So once again, let's go back to router three here 
and uh, let's see what best path he is currently using. So if we, if we think about through it logically, next hop should be reachable, that shouldn't be a problem. And Willa, weight. Well, he should not have any weight. Weight is zero, so there shouldn't be any weight. Uh, local preference should be the same, right? When he learned about it this way, CSR1 told him the local preference was 100. We learned about this way, same thing, local preference was 100. We learned about this way, local preference was zero, but he added 100 to it himself. So local preference isn't gonna help us, so that's N Willa. Um, so then we go to locally originate. Well, Router 3 did not locally originate the 12.12.12 network. He doesn't own it. It wasn't his job to use the network command to inject it in BGP, so it's not locally originate from his perspective. Okay, then we go to, in the N Willa, we have the A, which is AS path. And here's where a lot of times it stops. The prefix that has the shortest AS path is the winner. So if, uh, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Okay, so the ones that he received this way will have the AS path of 12 in the list. And the one he received this way will say 2, 12. Start in AS 12, went through AS 2. So we definitely know that router 3 is not going to prefer CSR 2 by default because CSR2's AS path is longer than the other ones he's getting. So let's use local preference to influence that. Let's tell router three, hey, I actually do want you to use CSR2 and prefer him. So we're gonna do the same thing. So here in router, router three, I'm gonna perform a lot of the same steps here. I'm gonna create an access list. Access-list one, matching on that route. All right, and then I'll create a route map. I'll just call it LP for local preference. We'll match on that access list and we'll set the BGB local preference. Now remember the default is 100, right? And just like weight, how a higher weight is more preferred, a higher local preference is more preferred. So I'll just give it a local preference of 101 Okay, once again, I wanna create a second instance of that route map that catches everything else, but just leaves it untouched, unchanged. All right, so now we'll go into router BGP 134, and we'll apply this route map against inbound stuff we received from CSR2. So neighbor 32.32.32.22 route-map LP in. And once again, this is not going to immediately take effect. It does not affect the stuff that's currently in this table. So I have to send a route refresh message, clear IP uh, BGP star in, get all my neighbors to resend me their routes again. And now when I do show IP BGP, ah, if I could type, there we go. All right, uh, something has not happened yet. Where is it? There we go. Okay, this took a little bit of time. All right, so now we can see that this first entry right there is my best path. Once again, it's got that greater than symbol right at the beginning right there. That tells me that that is my best path. Next hop is 32.32.32.22. That is the route that I learned from CSR2, and it is the best because it has a local preference of 101, which is higher than the same route that he learned from, who did he learn that from? Uh, 21, 21, 21.2, that would be the route he learned from CSR1. Right, that would be the one he learned from CSR1. So there we see it, local preference was used to influence which, was, which route was the best. And once again, we did that with a route map, and we did that with the set local preference. So right there, mashed on my ACL, set local preference, and gave it a number higher than the default. Okay, we could also make routes look worse, right? We could set their local preference to something less than 100, which would make them look worse than other routes that were set with the default. Okay. Uh, so that's N Willa. Um, so now, um, so locally originated routes. 
that means that a router itself has used either the redistribute or the network command to take a route out of his IGP table, like a RIP route or an OSPF route or a static route, and inject it into BGP. That's what we consider to be a locally originated route. And if that's the case, and then he learns of that same route from somebody else, his locally originated route will be preferred. Now, once again, that's after weight is considered and after local preference is considered. Locally originated routes will then be preferred, okay? Uh, so that's not really something carried with a path attribute. So the next thing then is AS path. And I mentioned to you how the way AS path works is that let's say this is the route that I've learned, x dot x dot x dot x, and I've learned it via two different peers, 1.1.1.1 and via 2222. 2, 2. Okay? And let's say that the, there's no weight, so the weight is zero for both of them. Let's say the local preference is the default of 100 for both of them. But as we go further on down, their autonomous system paths look like this. Maybe this guy is 10, 100. This guy is 20, uh, 22, and 99. Okay. So these numbers are showing you the autonomous systems where this route went through. So the way you read this, the AS path, is the number on the far right, or the last number, that's what we call the originating autonomous system. So this is where the route actually lives. So XXXX, whatever that route is, that actually lives. Well, we couldn't have this two different numbers here, could we? We'd have to have the same, uh, we'd have to have uh, the same number here. So let's just do it like this, just to make it technically correct. Um, 99, and let's just put here, Four. Okay. So let's just get rid of that and go back to this. Okay, so both of these routes, or it's the exact same route, that route lives in autonomous system number 99. That is my originating autonomous system. Now, once it left autonomous system number 99, it actually took two different paths. The routing update that contained this prefix went first into neighboring AS100, and then to neighboring AS10, AS4, and AS4, so on this particular router, AS4 is our neighbor's autonomous system. So our ISP or our partner, they are in autonomous system number four, they are our external peer, and they sent it to us. Okay, so that was the last autonomous system number it hit before it came into our autonomous system. So we can see here, that this particular path has a total of four autonomous systems in it, right? Four, 10, 199, whereas this path only has three autonomous systems in it. So once again, if weight and local preference were not a factor, this one would be considered our best route because of the shorter AS path. Now we can actually use this to our advantage, use, use the knowledge of this. Let's go back to looking at our picture right here. Okay, so right now, router one and router two are both advertising the 12 network. Let's get them now to advertise that second loopback, the 12, 21, 21, 21 network, okay? Now here's what I wanna do. Now, you know, router one and router two, they only have a limited ability to influence CSR number one. Because you know, if CSR number one is using weight or local preference, there's nothing that router one and router two can do to say, hey, CSR number one, um, I want you to forget about weight local preference and instead we want you to do it this way. In other words, what if I, what if I was the network administrator for AS12, okay? That's my autonomous system. And here's what I want. When AS12 advertises the exact same routes into another autonomous system like into AS134, what I would prefer is I want that autonomous system to prefer this path, okay? So when they actually send packets into my autonomous system number 12, I want them to send their packets into my router one. I really don't want them to use router two to get into my autonomous system unless it's like a backup or something like that. Okay, so I'm not the autonomous, I'm not the administrator of AS134. I can't jump on those routers and manipulate them. So using path attributes, is there a path attribute I could send in my updates, okay? So if, 
router one and router two are both going to send the 12.21 network. Okay, if they're both going to do that, and my objective is I want CSR1 to prefer as his best path the top link, the link going to router one. What I can do is, you know, I can't send weight, I can't send local preference but I can manipulate the autonomous system path. Normally, both router one and router two, they would just say, okay, well, the AS path is 12 because it's leaving our autonomous system and it, and it lives here. Well, why don't I do this? Why don't I go down to router two and say, hey, router two, when you advertise this route, I actually want you to artificially make that path longer. Why don't we add some more instances of 12 to that AS path so your AS path is not as good because it's longer than the AS path that router one is advertising. This is actually called AS path prepending, what we're talking about right here. So I'm gonna go into router two and I'm gonna say, hey, when you advertise stuff outbound to CSR1 that matches the 12.2121 network, I want you to artificially inflate the path by adding some additional instances of 12 to it. Now, a little caveat here. If you're doing this in a lab environment, you can artificially inflate that with any numbers you want. I could use AS path prepending to say, hey, router two, when you send it, say 12, and then the next AS is 99, the next AS after that is 714. You could put whatever numbers you want in there in a lab environment. In a real production environment, you probably wouldn't wanna do that because you might accidentally be putting someone's real legitimate AS into your prepended path, and that could cause some issues. We don't wanna do that. So the the rules of polite society say that if you're going to use AS path prepending, you should only add multiple instances of your own AS into the path. So that's what we're going to do right here. All right. So first of all, let's get router one and router two to advertise that 1221 route. All right, so router BGP 12, network 12, 21, 21, 21. Nope, that's wrong. Zero, mask 255, 255, 255, zero. Okay, and same thing for router two. Okay, so now they're both advertising the exact same route to CSR1. I have not done any prepending yet. I just want to make sure that CSR1 does indeed get that route. All right, so there it is, All right? And only has one AS in the path, which is the originating AS, AS12. Okay, so now what I'm going to do, and it looks like uh, he's actually preferring router one at 11, 11, 11, one is the next hop. Okay, so I, that, that's fine, that's what I want. But I'm just gonna show you prepending. So I'm gonna go back onto router two now. Same process, I'm gonna create an access list. And you could use a prefix list as well if you're more comfortable with prefix lists. I'm just using access list because I think more people know ACLs than they know prefix lists. So access dash list, let's just say two, permit 12, 21, 21, zero. Okay, route dash map, we'll just call this prepend. And we'll say match IP address to set AS dash path prepend, and let's just add some additional instances of 12 to it. There we go, we'll add four more. And once again, we want to create a second instance of our route map so that we uh, don't accidentally filter out other things. All right, so router BGP 12. So remember, we're in router two here. So I'm going to say neighbor 21.21.21.11 route dash map prepend out. So anytime I send an outbound routing update to that neighbor, I'm going to run it through this route map called prepend. And if it matches the 12, 21, 21, I'm going to artificially increase the length of the AS path. And once again, it's not going to take any effect 
unless I get router two to resend his routes. So I'm going to say clear IP BGP star outbound. And now if we go back to CSR one and do the same command, see, it worked. So now there's that 1221 network, learn from router two, and now we have multiple instances of AS12. We have prepended the path. We have made it artificially longer, which makes it worse than the exact same route he learned from router one. So that is AS path prepending. All right, I got a little bit of time left here. So uh, let's see here, what else do we want to look at? So uh, I, I don't have any personal firsthand experience with this, but I have heard from, from multiple I need clients and other customers I've had as learners in my classes, they've told me that sometimes when you're talking to an internet service provider and you know, you're setting up your contract with them to do BGP peering with them, some internet service providers will actually tell you, we don't allow AS path prepending. Don't do that when you send routes to us. As a matter of fact, if you do that, we have filters set up in place where we will just drop that route as if we never got it in the first place. So don't do prepending. Okay. Well, if that's the case, let's go right back here. Once again, if my objective is, hey, um, I want to influence CSR1, I want him to prefer router1, but I can't use ASPath prepending to do that. Well, is there any other attribute I could send to CSR1 which would sort of accomplish the same objective? And there is. There is a path attribute called the multi-exit discriminator, what we call MED. Now, it would be nice if things were always consistent, right? So, so far we've learned that when it comes to weight, the higher the value, the better it is. Local preference, the higher the value, the better it is. Well, guess what? With MED, it's just the opposite. The lower the value, the better it is. So, in the Nwilla Omni, okay, I, I'm skipping the O for just a moment, we'll get back to that. This is the M, okay? So this is uh, the, the med in the Nwilla Omni, and lower is better. Now, by default, if you and I are external BGP peers, when I send you a med value, it's gonna be zero. That's the default med value. And I might say, well, wait a second, how can you get less than zero? Does med support negative numbers? No, it doesn't. You can only make med bigger than zero, but here's how we can do this. All right, so now before I do med, I'm going to uh, clear my route map statement from router two. Okay, let's get rid of this guy right here. All right, clear IP BGP star out. So we should be back at a nice clean state there. All right, so here's what I'm gonna do. Once again, if my objective is, I wanna try to influence CSR1. And when these guys send CSR1 the exact same route, I want CSR1, at least for the 12.21 network, I want him to prefer router one. And I've been told, don't use AS path prepending, not allowed. Okay, well I can use med. Knowing as I do that a lower value is preferred, why don't I do just do this? I know that when router one sends that route, by default, he's gonna send it with a med equal to zero. Okay. And actually if I looked at uh, one of my previous sniffer traces, we would see that in there. So right in here, uh, let's see, let's, uh, where is a BGP update? Here we go, update message. Just collapse some of these things here that we're not talking about. Next hop, right here, multi-exit discriminator. And notice the value by default is zero, okay? So that's in there, that's one of the path attributes. So here's what I'm gonna do, knowing that lower is better, I'm gonna let this guy advertise the 1221 network with a med of zero. I'm not gonna change him, but I'm gonna to go to this guy here and I'm gonna have him advertise it with a med of one. Once again, if lower is better, 
everything else being equal, if CSR1 is not cons considering weight or local preference or AS path and he gets down to the M in Omni, he will prefer the path to router one because of the lower med. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So let's go to router two here. And I'm just gonna reuse that same access list that I already have. I think it's access list two, yep. So I'm gonna create another route map, route-map, we'll just call it med permit 10, match IP address two for that access list. Now here's the one little, little weird thing. With weight, it was the set weight command. With local preference, it was the set local preference command. Here with, even though the attribute is called the multi-exit discriminator, it's not set med or set multi-exit discriminator. It's actually set metric. That's how you do it in the Cisco router in the route map, set metric, and I'll just do set metric of one. All right, let's do a second instance of that route map. All right, so now we'll go router BGP 12. Once again, apply it outbound against my neighbor. Neighbor 21.21.21.11, route dash map, med out. Clear IP BGP star out. All right, so now when we go to CSR1, so notice before I did anything, he had the default metric, what we call the med value of zero for everything. Now let's take a look at the difference. There we go. So now for this route right here, okay, the weight is zero on both of them. That doesn't factor in. The local preference, well, he didn't learn any local preference, so he assigned the default local preference of 100 to both of them, which doesn't show here, but it would show in the, the other output of show IP BGP 12.2121.0. And so local preference wasn't a factor. He did not locally originate this route. Both of them have the same AS path length, just a single AS in the path, just one number, number 12. So now we get to the M, uh, so origin code, we sort of skip past that. We'll talk about that in a second, but the origin code is listed right here. Well, we can see they're both exactly the same origin code. Now we get to the M in med and sure enough, we have one and zero. We know that lower is better. So that's why this bottom route here ended up becoming the best path because zero is better. Now here's one other thing to know about the multi-exit discriminator. And uh, for this, I'm just gonna do a little bit of a, uh, actually we can reference our, our same diagram here. So let's take a look at router four, okay? Now, multi-exit discriminator is a non-transitive attribute, which means if you and I are external peers and I send you an EBGB update like router two is doing with CSR one. And in that EBG update, I give you a med value of like one or 12 or whatever it is. You and all the people in your autonomous system number that you can use that, but you cannot advertise that med value to another autonomous system number. So when you go to send an EBGB update or any of your other friends do, you gotta strip out that med value. You can put in your own med value, but you can't forward my med value into another AS, it is a non-transitive. So imagine this for just a moment, okay? So imagine that uh, we have it coming like this, all right? Actually, so remember with, it, with BGP, once you select the best route, the best route is what goes in your own IP routing table, and that's the one you advertise to other people. So when these came in like this with a med of one here and a med of zero here, well, what he's gonna advertise out is the med of zero because that's his best path. Okay. But let's say we did this. Um, let's go ahead and sort of run out of time here. This might be, we'll try to fit in origin code real quickly after this. I'm gonna go to router one, do the same type of thing. Come on router one, wake up. 
access dash list to permit 12 at 2121.0 route dash map med permit 10 match IP address two up oh. set metric let's just say five um, exit Twenty. Okay, and now router BGP twelve. Up. Oh, trying to hurry too much here. Router BGP twelve. Neighbor. Eleven 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 dot eleven route dash map med out. Clear IP BGP star out. All right. So now what we should see on CSR one is a med value of one and a med value of five from those two different neighbors. Okay, so here we go, right? One and five. So now router two is the preferred router because his med value is lower. All right, so this brings us to what I was about to talk about, which is, all right, so let's look at router four right here. So what's gonna happen is uh, we had five coming in this way, one coming in this way, so CSR1 is going to advertise out the best route, so the one with a med value of 1. Okay? Now, when router 2 advertised that same route to CSR2, we didn't have any route maps applied to that, so the med value was 0 there. Now, CSR2, he cannot forward that med value into ASN134, but what he can do is strip it out, and put his own default med of zero. So here we have something like this coming in, zero, okay? So you're looking at router four, you might think, okay, well, if I go with that n Willa omni best pass selection process, okay, um, then it, as if everything was identical, okay, which it won't be here, but if it was, you might think, oh, well, then in this case, uh, the update that he got from CSR2 will be preferred because the med is lower than the update he got from CSR1. Mm that wouldn't work because there's another rule of med. Med says, look, if I get down to the, the M in N Willa Omni and I'm starting to compare med from all these different neighbors who sent me the same prefix, I can only compare med if neighbors are in the same autonomous system number. So what that means is, let's say he got some updates that look like this. These came from AS200. Uh, and he got some other updates from here, you know, just making up some stuff. These came from AS777, uh, okay? He could look at the med value of these two guys, compare them against each other to figure out which of those two was best among them. He might say, okay, of those two, that guy's best. And he could look at the med value of these two guys and figure out which one was best, you know, maybe that guy right there. But then when he compared this guy against this guy, he could not look at their med values to make that determination because those are in different autonomous systems. So he'd have to proceed further on down the chain of the n Willa Omni to try to figure out which one was best. Now there is a command you can use in BGP which says, you know what? I always want you to compare med. I don't care if they're from different autonomous systems or not. That command is Um, BGP, always compare med. Now, I'm not sure why you'd want to do that, because when you think about it, the med value coming from AS134, you know, what's the reason for that? What was the logic behind why they set their med? What, what we don't know, right? We're not the network admins in 134. We don't know what's going through their head. We just know they're sending us med values. And med values coming from AS999, same thing. What's the logic? What's the reasoning why they're setting med values? Chances are pretty good that what these guys are thinking is not the same as what those guys are thinking, okay? But this, this command here says, hey, we don't care what their thought process is. If they're both sending us med from different autonomous systems, we'll go ahead and compare those numbers to see which one is better. All right, so the last one I wanna look at today, and then we've run out of time, is the origin code. This one's pretty easy to show you here. So the origin code uh, in the n Willa Omni. 
So we had N Willa, O right there. So this is the O in Omni. This is what's called the origin code. This is a mandatory path attribute. And we can see it right here. There's the origin code. And in the BGP RFC, technically there are three origin codes you could possibly see. Let me go back to here so I have a little bit more space. Okay, so the three origin codes you could see are IGP, EGP, and incomplete. Now you're never gonna see this. EGP was actually the precursor to BGP. There was a, another exterior gateway protocol that was called the exterior gateway protocol that was out many decades ago and uh, it's gone. I don't think any routers ever support anymore, so you'll never see that, all right? So all you're gonna see are origin codes of IGP or incomplete. Here's basically what it boils down to. In a Cisco router, we have two ways primarily that we can take an OSPF or a static or a connected route out of our IGP table and inject it into BGP. One way is by using the network command, and that's what I've been doing in all these demonstrations. When you use the network command, that sets the origin code to IGP. The other way is you could use the redistribute command. You know, in BGP, I could say redistribute OSPF or redistribute static. If I do that, that will set the origin code to incomplete if I use the redistribute command. Well, as far as the BGP best path selection process is concerned, they say that IGP is better than incomplete. So if I get, if two different neighbors send me the exact same route, but one of them has an origin code of IGP and the other has an origin code of incomplete, if I get all the way down to the O in Enwilla Omni, I will prefer the IGP versus the incomplete. All right, so here's how we're gonna do this, real simple. I'm gonna go to, uh, uh, first of all, let's strip out some of the, the route map stuff we have here. Let's go to router one. Actually, we'll just uh, create a new loopback just to do it real quick. Interface loopback, let's say three. IP address 33, 33, 33. Oh, we've already got, uh, no, we don't have the 33 network in here. So let's just go 133, 133, 133 dot, let's just say one. All right, and router two. Okay, so now they both contain the same network. All right, here's what I'm gonna do. On router two, I'm gonna advertise that network using the network command. So router EGP 12 network 133, 133, 133.0. Now before I do that, let's just go ahead and stop this and then start it again so we can get a clean slate here. Bam. Okay, so there's our BGP update message for that. Uh, we scroll down here, let's collapse some of these. All right, so there's the 133 network and the origin code is IGP because I use the network command. And in receiving routers, that shows up in the BGP table at the very end. Right there is that little I. So that's where your origin code is, IGP. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to router one and I'm gonna have him advertise that exact same route, but this time on him, I'm just gonna use the redistribute command. I'm gonna say redistribute connected. You know what, let's just make this specific here because I only want to affect that 133 network. So access-list, uh, let's say four, Permit 133, 133, 133, zero. All right, route dash map, we'll just call it origin. Match IP address 
four. We don't have to change anything here. I just want to use this for matching purposes. All right, and uh, do show run section BGP. Let's remove any existing route maps we have in here so we don't muddy the waters here. So let's get rid of this guy. Ah, come on. And now let's say neighbor 11.11.11 route-map origin out. Okay, so right now I haven't changed anything. All I've done is I said, when you send anything to 11.11.11, run it through the route map called origin. Well, what's origin doing? Well, right now, the first sequence of origin is matching on this axis list, but we're not changing anything. There's no set commands. So we're just advertising it as is. Um, it's saying, if we advertise it, we're not gonna change it. And the second sequence number is matching on everything else, once again, not changing it. So now here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say redistribute connected but I want to run my connected subnets through the route map called origin. Redistribute connected route map origin. Actually, before I do that, actually, I don't want that second sequence number. The whole purpose here is I just want to redistribute the 133 network. So I'll say no route dash map origin permit 20. Let's get rid of that one. Okay, so redistribute connected route dash map origin. All right, so now router one should be advertising that same 133 network. And let's see here, update want to get the one from router one. Well, this will probably, uh, well, we're not, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see it in the sniffer trace because if we look at the positioning of where my Wireshark capture device is right here, see now we're coming down with an origin code of incomplete. Here we're coming down with an origin code of IGP. And the only thing that the CSR is going to advertise this way is his best path. So he's not going to advertise the, he's not going to forward the update that's got the incomplete origin code. He's only going to forward the update that's got the origin code of IGP. So we're not going to see that in there. But we can see it in CSR1's table at least, even though we can't see it in the BGP, in the Wireshark capture. So CSR1 here. All right, and here's how you see it this way, is right there, that little question mark. That means the origin code is incomplete, which means we use the redistribute command. We can also dive a little bit deeper in there, and we can say show IP BGP, 133, 133, 1330 slash 24, and it shows it in here as well, All right? Here's the one that says origin incomplete. Here's the one that says origin IGP. This was done as a result of redistribution. This one was done as a result of using the BGP network command. All right, that my friends is all we have time for today. So uh, I will go ahead and now take a look at whatever questions you have. There are a few other remaining BGP path attributes, but I don't want to take another hour, hour and a half of your time going through that. Uh, maybe another day we'll get into that. So let's go ahead and check out the Q&A here and see if we have any questions. Okay. Uh, so starting at the top here. So Risa asks a very good question saying, why do we need IBGP when in case we also have an interior gateway protocol? All right, good question. Uh, three reasons I can think of. Reason number one could be due to scalability. For example, your interior gateway protocols of RIP, OSPF, EIGRP, 
they work really well up until you've got about oh, 4,000 routes, roughly. So I actually worked once with a customer who had started out using EIGRP as their interior gateway, but their internal network had grown so massive and so huge that they are getting traceback messages and EIGRP errors and things because they had so many routes that EIGRP couldn't handle it. And that particular case, our solution was to take their core network that needed to know everything and migrated over to using BGP because BGP can actually handle hundreds of thousands of routes, literally. No other routing protocol can do that. So that was an example of where a, cup, a customer needed to run BGP, in that case, iBGP, because all the routers were in the same autonomous system to handle that massive scalability. That's reason number one. Reason number two is um, if you're a control freak, <laughs> like if, if you're the type of person that needs to, that likes to have a lot of bells and whistles and, and different ways to manipulate the routes and you really like to get your hands dirty with route filtering and route manipulation, well, BGP gives you more ways to do that than any other routing protocol. So if that's the type of thing that floats your boat, BGP will give it to you. And then reason number three is if you want or you need your autonomous system number to be a transitive autonomous system number or a transit autonomous system number. For example, imagine if we got this situation where you've got a uh, Time Warner cable here, you've got uh, Sprint here, and you've got AT&T right here, all right? And Sprint has a bunch of routers like this. Well, all these routers are gonna to need to learn all the BGP routes so that routes that come in this way can continue on through them to AT&T. So all these routers here would need to run IBGPP, IBGP, so that Sprint's AS could be what's called a transit autonomous system. So that would be answers to that question. Thank you for your question, Riza. Um, is there a way to remember the order, like a sentence or something? Ah. I wish there was. Um, I always remember as, you know, N will omni o. It's just so weird. It sticks in my head. I'm sure there's some, I, I've tried searching, you know, Google and stuff to see if anybody came up with some fancy acronyms for that or, you know, memory, you know, mnemonics or something. I'm sure somebody has, but I wasn't able to find anything. So if you can find one, go ahead and post it here into the Q&A so that other people can benefit from that. But yeah, it's a pretty weird, nasty thing to try to remember. So Sorry, anonymous, I couldn't uh, give you a better answer to that. Okay, um, so how do you learn the order and do you need to remember it? Well, yes, uh, like I said, there's no easy way to remember, but do you need to? Absolutely, two reasons. Number one, if you're ever gonna take any certification test, like let's focus on Cisco for a second. If you take like a Cisco CCNP on up, you will absolutely need to know what that best path selection algorithm is. You'll need to know those in the correct order to answer your multiple choice questions. Uh, secondly, if you're actually running BGP in a production environment, there will be situations where you might be, scratch your head and say, why was this route preferred? You know, I, I've learned, I'm looking at my topology diagram right here, and, and I thought it was going to go this way, but for that exact same prefix, he's going this way. Why is that? Well, if you did not know what the best path selection process was, you would have no way of answering that question. So that's the practical reason why you would need to know it. Um, and Anonymous also writes, can I use path attributes to influence my IGP route selection? No, you cannot. Uh, this is just strictly a, a BGP thing. This is all, you know, this is just for the BGP protocol. You know, other protocols like OSPF and EIGRP, they have their own methods like route tags and things like that. But like I said, there's far less ways you can manipulate your interior gateway protocols than you can manipulate BGP. All right, so thank you, Anonymous. Um, all right, so uh, MD Mejanur, uh, can you give a little bit of over your AS path prepending? Well, I pretty much figured we did that. We did a demonstration of that in the lab. And once again, just to review, AS path prepending means, okay, when I send you my autonomous system path, in my update, I'm just gonna artificially make it long. I'm just gonna stick some other autonomous system numbers in the path to make it longer than this guy over here because I want you to prefer him, not me. So that's AS path prepending. Okay, so we've done that. 
Let's see here. Uh, can I use local preference to configure BGP failover or which attribute would you recommend? Yes, you absolutely can use local preference for that. Um, so certainly if, if this is my autonomous system number, let's see if I can give myself a little bit more room here, a little bit more black screen to draw on. Okay. So if this is my autonomous system number right here, and let's say we're using ISP1 and ISP2, and they're both sending us the exact same route, and in my autonomous system number, let's just say my ASN is uh, 65,000, okay? We wanna use ISP number one. We could certainly say, okay, well, when ISP number one sends us a route, let's just put a, a local preference value in there of let's say 200. And when ISP2 sends us the exact same route, we're just gonna leave that with the default local preference of 100. And so now as long as ISP1 is sending us the route, we will always use them. We'll always go out this way. But if, if this connection to this ISP fails and goes down, well then this route will now be used as our backup route. It's still there, just has a, a lower local preference. And remember with local preference, higher is better, a higher number is preferred. So you can certainly use that for, uh, for failover, for redundancy. Absolutely. And that's probably the preferred way to do it as well. All right, so thank you, Sam. Uh, Mateo, uh, could you explain the same process with prefix instead of an ACL? Sure, uh, real quickly here. So with a prefix list, in router one, if I want to match on one of those loopbacks, like let's say the 12, 12, 12, 0 network, I would simply say IP prefix dash list, uh, give it a name like I and E, okay? Uh, at this point, you could give it a sequence number if you want to. If you leave off the sequence number, the first one of I and E will be sequence 10. The next one I configure with the name of I and E will be sequence 20 and there'll be an increments of 10. So I'm just gonna leave that alone. Permit or deny. And if I wanna match a specific network, 12, 12, 12, 0, slash 24, and that will match that particular network. So in this particular case, the slash 24, so remember, in your BGP update, okay, at the bottom, we had two fields. We had the prefix field, and we had the length field. All right, so 12, 12, 12 would look like that, and length would say slash 24, or just, just the number 24. So if in my prefix list, I say slash 24, then that's actually matching on two things. That's saying, okay, look in the prefix field. If the first 24 bits of that number matches the first 24 bits of this number, it's a match. And look in the length field. If the length field, which contains a subnet mask, is the number 24, it's a match. So this is an and statement. Slash 24 means the prefix, the first 24 bits, and the length have to match. Now with a prefix list, you can get a lot more complicated though. For example, I could say something like this. I could say um, greater than or equal to 27. I could do that. So now if I did it like that, now what we'd be seeing is in the prefix field, we'd say, okay, the slash 24 now is only matching on this, saying the first 24 bits of this number need to match 12, 12, 12. If it matches, that's a hit. It's not matching on the length field. Now the length field is being matched by this. It's saying if the subnet mask is saying a 27 or a 28, all the way up to a host route of slash 32, then we have a match. So that's a, a quick overview of using prefix list to match on something instead of an access list. Good question, Mateo. A uh, question here from Todd. What are the commands to filter AS prepending from neighbors? Is it using a route map to apply an ACL prefix list? No. Um, I know the theory here, but it's been like ages since I've actually done it. So when you want, so when the thing you want to match on is the actual AS path itself, 
You would not use an access list or a prefix list to do that. You would configure something called an IP, is it IP? AS-path access-list 10 permit. Yeah, okay, this is what you would use. You would use something called an AS path access dash list. And honestly, I'm not sure why they even have IP in the front of that, because this isn't even looking necessarily at the protocol. This is just looking at the AS path. And here you would use regular expressions. I am not a regular expressions guru. I know some of them. For example, if you said uh, something like this, okay, what that would be doing is it's saying, okay, here's the AS path, maybe I've got, you know, 17, 200, maybe this route originated in AS 88. And if my neighboring AS is 65, that's a match. That's what that means. I don't know what the regular expression is to match on prepending. I know there is one, but you would create a regular expression that says, if you see the same number multiple times, that's a prepended route. And then in your route map, you would match on your AS path access list that you've created here. So that's how you would uh, do that. I just don't know what the actual regular expression is to match on prepended routes. You can Google that. I'm sure you can find what that is. Uh, so thank you, Todd. Um, so Ross, you said when you, when you type in clear IP BGP star out, is an update message or route refresh? Great question. So when I do clear IP BGP star in that, so if I did to you, right, let, let's say that you are my neighbor of 1111. So let's say on me, I did clear IP BGP 1111 in. Well, then I would send you a route refresh request you would send me your BGP update, maybe multiple updates, sending me all your routes again. That's in. If I do clear IP BGP 1111 out, that's just kickstarting me to send, me, send you all of my updates again. So the outbound means just resend your BGP update messages to that peer again. Even if nothing's changed, just resend all of your routes to that guy inside of a BGP update message. So the only time you'll see route refresh is when you do the inbound direction. Thank you, Ross. All right. So that is so several of them right there. Okay. Uh, Mejanur, I, I think we've already talked about AS path prepending in med. I, you know, we've talked about that quite extensively and uh, I, I think we, we've covered that. So, you know, because you're in here, you will get the recording of this. So just watch over the recording again, where I talked about AS path prepending and med and the differences between them. I, I think we covered that pretty well. Uh, let's see. Okay, so Radek, you're just asking for some um, other topics we could cover in the future. Okay, so yeah, thank you. We, we can definitely cover that in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that suggestion. Um, and Ashwani, you said, what should be the right attribute to be considered for BGP load balancing? Ah, okay. So here's how the way load balancing works. And once again, this is the, something I haven't touched in a while, but it, I, you know, I, I can give you the high level overview of it. So we know the default behavior of BGP is if I receive the exact same prefix from two or more peers, I'm gonna go through that best path selection process and eventually I will find something in that list that's different where I can say, aha, that's the winner, that's the best path. So BGP by default never does load balancing. It just, it doesn't do that, but you can get it to do that. So there's, um, I don't remember what the command was, but there's a command that you can type in that says, look, if the first five or six path attributes all line up and they're all the same, and, and I don't remember if it's the first four or five or six, but there's a command that says, look, if the first several attributes are all the same, at that point, you can use both of those paths and put them in your routing table and you can load balance between them. Now that command does not stop or negate the best path selection process. You see, what will happen is, it will still go through those paths and select one of them as best, 
and only the best one will be advertised to your neighbors. That command will just allow you to do load balancing locally in your own router on your routing table, but does not allow you to send those exact same paths to other neighbors downstream. I just, I'm sorry, I don't remember what that command was um, or what the path attributes are that have to line up. I just remember it was like the first five or six of them that did that. Once again, I would just Google BGP load balancing and you'll be able to find that pretty easily. Okay, uh, Mejinur also asked in, in MPLS infrastructure, can I run iBGP? Absolutely, uh, yeah, you, you can run that. I think, I think the label distribution protocol, LDP, uh, relies on some sort of IGP routing protocol in order to create and distribute labels. I don't believe the label distribution protocol will look at BGP routes for that, uh, but you can certainly you know, run IBGP to propagate your own routes or route, you know, internet routes in tandem with your MPLS environment. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, Lux Mandri asks, what are the attributes we can use to manipulate the path from the outside? Well, uh, we talked about AS path prepending. You can do that. That could, are, so I'm interpreting your question as this. I'm interpreting you're saying, look, how do I influence my neighbor's autonomous system? I wanna influence what they select as their best path. How do I do that from within my autonomous system? Well, we talked about AS path prepending. If they allow that, you can do that. We talked about the multi-exit discriminator, that will do it. Um, we also know that the origin code will pass from one AS to the other. So if we have two routers right here in my AS, and I want to influence you. I want you to prefer this guy right here. So let's say both of these routers are going to advertise the 75.000 network. They're both going to advertise it, which lives here in my AS. Well, one thing I could do is I could say, okay, on this router here, I'm going to advertise the 75 network with the BGP network command, which will cause an origin code of IGP to be sent to you. This router right here, I'm going to redistribute that route, which will cause an origin code of incomplete. And now you, if everything else, you know, when the N will Omni lines up and you get down to the, um, the O in Omni, you will prefer the origin code of IGP versus incomplete. So that's another way I could influence you. Uh, but those are, those are the three methods I'm aware of. AS path, med, and origin code that you could try to influence a, a neighboring autonomous system. So thank you for that question. Um, Silas can't really answer that question. Um, you're asking uh, for, the, for the new Cisco exams, how much depth will BGP be examined? I would expect quite a bit of depth. Uh, if, if you think about it, it doesn't seem to be in the new CCNA. So if you look at the CCNA blueprint, the old CCNA that they just did away with actually did have a little bit of BGP in there. They decided to strip that out. So you're not gonna encounter BGP until you get to the CCNP level. Uh, now BGP is listed in both the CCNP enterprise infrastructure, it's listed in the Encore exam and the NRC exam. And if you look at those blueprints, it looks like the NRC exam is where you need to know all this stuff and more. So the NRC exam is gonna get into the gory details of it, but the Encore exam also does mention it in there as well. And if you think about it, you know, the Encore exam is also what sort of replaced the routing and switching written exam. So if, if Cisco is telling us, which they are, look, if you want to take the CCIE Enterprise Infrastructure Lab, you have to first pass the Encore. I would expect the Encore exam to have the same level of BGP as what the previous CCIE routing and switching written exam had, which was pretty much everything. So I would expect it to be at very great detail. So thank you, Silas. Uh, so Badri, we just answered that question already. What attributes can influence another autonomous system? We covered that. Um, autonomous asks, is there any reason you would not prefer redistributing eBGP into your IGP? Absolutely, scalability, right? It goes back to what I said earlier, which is your IGP routing protocols of OSPF, RIP, and EIGRP, they're gonna choke and die if you send them tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of routes. 
BGP has no problem with that. So if, if my internet facing router has actually learned of the full global, B, forget about the full global routing table, which is like 800,000 routes right now. Let's say I've learned a meager 15,000 routes via BGP. Well, if you try to redistribute that into OSPF, RIP or EIGRP, it better go looking for another job because your router is going to blow up and die. It's, it's not going to be able to handle that. So that's the biggest reason why you would not want to redistribute your BGP routes into your interior gateway protocol. It might blow up and kill you. Um, <laughs> Devin, yep. Uh, we love oranges as oranges mean pure refreshment. That, that, that's right. That is one. I forgot about that one. I forgot about that one. Yeah, so that is a mnemonic you could use. We for weight, love for local preference, um, origins. Problem with that one is that that's skipping a couple of things. It's not covering the few, the, the full N Willa Omni, but it, it does get you close. So yeah, that does help. Thank you for that, Devin. I totally forgot about that one. Um, so Syed says, what is the preferred way of path selection? AS path prepending or med? in a production network? Well, that's a difficult one to say because I would say if you're trying to influence a neighbor's autonomous system, it would probably be better to use MED instead of AS path prepending. While on the one hand, I've heard stories of some ISPs and stuff saying don't do Prepending, we will filter. If we see prepending, don't do it. I've never heard any stories of an ISP saying, don't use med, don't do that. So since there's a possibility that AS path prepending could be a negative thing and could cause your ISP to filter and just kill your routes, that's not going to happen with med. So med is probably a safer bet. Uh, and then Anonymous asks, what, is, what happens when everything in Nwilla Omni is equal? Which path is preferred? It's not. It's not going to be equal. If we go back here, let's take a look at this. Look at those last few things here. If you get down to that last thing, there's no way it's going to be equal, right? Lowest neighbor's IP address. If I'm getting the, the whole purpose of Nwilla Omni is I'm getting the exact same prefix from two or more neighbors. Well, there's no way that two or more neighbors are going to be using the exact same IP address to reach them. It's not going to happen. So at, a, at the very least, when you get down to that last thing, one neighbor is going to have a lower IP address than the other neighbor, and that's going to be your winner. So it, you will never have a tie. Good question, though. Um, and... We'll just do another uh, 10 minutes of questions here. So some of your questions here are related to path attributes. Other questions are not. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm going to cover the questions I see that are directly related to path attributes. And then if we have a minute or two left, I'll circle back and hit the ones that are not related to that. Uh, so Phil, you ask about community strings. All right, so just a quick overview of, of BGP communities. So a BGP community at a real high level is kind of like route tagging in the world of EIGRP and OSPF. So um, a BGP community string, so by default, there are no community strings in a BGP update, uh, but you can put them in there. It's its own unique path attribute. It's, it's a number, right? And with BGP communities, there's two different types of communities. There's what's called standard communities, which is a 32-bit number. And you can put anything you want in there, anything you want. You can, you've got, what, billions of possibilities with a 32-bit number. That's a standard community. And then later on, they came out with something called extended communities, which is like a, um, wait, no, I think I got that wrong. I think a standard community is a 16-bit number, and an extended community is a 32-bit number. All right, that's right. So... The idea, let's just focus on the standard communities because that's what's used most often. So yeah, 16-bit number, right? Which is anywhere from community of zero up to like 65, 535 and everything in between. Well, a handful of those community numbers actually mean something. There's like 
four or five of them that actually mean something. Um, I don't think I have the slide up here right now. But for example, there's one community that, that if I select it, well, let's just actually take a look at it right here so we can actually see. All right, so route-map, I'll say community, permit 10, match IP address. It doesn't matter, I'm just gonna match something fake. Set community. All right, okay. Um, all right, this must be a 32-bit number then, because look at that, that is, uh, that's the range of it. So this is a standard community here. <clears throat> okay, so these ones right here are well-known communities and they, they match up with certain specific numbers. I don't remember what the actual number was, but for example, if, if I sent you a BGP update and inside that update, using my route map, I put in there the community called no advertise. And like I said, that maps to a particular number. I just don't know what it is but you would recognize that because that's a well-known number. Once you got that BGP update, you could use it for yourself, but because you see that no advertised community in there, it's just like it sounds. That would mean you are not allowed to advertise that update to anybody else. You can use it yourself, can't advertise it to anybody else. Um, the no export community, right? If you got that, if I sent you that, that means you can use that update, you can pass that update along to other IBGP neighbors in your same AS, but you can't export that update to another autonomous system, to an external peer. So that's, you know, the, these ones here have well-known meanings. Other than that, we could use a community for whatever we want. For example, you could say, hey, Keith, um, well, let's turn around, okay? Let, let's say you are my ISP, okay? And, and I represent the INE router. And say, hey, ISP, um, I'm just gonna pick on CBT nuggets here, okay? Um, so I'm gonna say, hey, ISP, if you ever send me routes that belong to CBT nuggets that originated in CBT nuggets autonomous system number, I wanna know about that because I wanna filter those out. Okay? Not to pick on CBT nuggets, but just as an example here. So here's my problem. At i and &E, I don't know what prefixes CBT nuggets uses. I don't know if they use the 90 network or the 200 network, I have no idea. So I can't create a prefix list or an ACL and match on that. Also, I might not know what autonomous system number they are, otherwise I could match on that. But you know that stuff. So here's why I say, I say, hey, when you send me routes that originate at CBT Nuggets, I want you to put a community in there of, let's just pick a number, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, so what you would do as the ISP, you would match on those routes because you know what the prefix is, you know what the AS is, you know, whatever, you would match on that and then you would set the community to one, two, three, four, five. You would send it to me and on my side, I would match on that community and I would filter it out. So you see that number, that community number of one, two, three, four, five, it didn't have any implicit meaning like local AS or no export. I assigned it a meaning and then I told you to flag the routes with that number. So that's what a BGP community is in most circumstances outside of these four or five here that have a specific number. It's just a, a classification tool to match on a route. All right, so thank you, Phil, for asking that question. Um, and Mateo, you're saying, uh, which BGP attribute should you know better than the others uh, in, the, in the exams? Well, at the top of the list, I would say you definitely want to know how the AS path community, community, how the AS path path attribute is used. And there's some permutations of that. So you should know what that's used for and how you can manipulate it. You want to know the origin code. That's a really important one. Uh, uh, weight and local preference. If I was just going to focus on four, it would be those four. AS path, origin code, weight, and local preference. Definitely know those ones really, really well, how to manipulate them, how to change them, how they affect the BGP table. But you don't want to neglect the other ones, like communities I just talked about. You want to know about that. Uh, you want to know about MED and those other things too, so don't neglect those. 
All right, so uh, Mateo, thanks for asking that. Let's see, are there any other questions here related to path attributes? Ah, Lionel or Lionel gave us the command, the neighbor, whatever the neighbor is, multipath. That's the command we were looking at to say, okay, if these five or six path attributes line up on the front end, then you can install these multiple paths to the same destination in your routing table. Great, thank you for that. That's the command we were looking for. All right, um, just to circle back now real quickly here, what's the difference between B2B star in, out, and soft? So we talked about BGP star in and out, right? When you do clear BGP star in, that's sending your neighbor a route refresh request message. When you do clear BGP star out, that means you're just resending your BGP updates to that neighbor, even though nothing has changed. Soft, what soft used to refer to was something called soft reconfiguration inbound. Um, so here was sort of like the idea behind that. A long time ago, people said, okay, I have a problem. I've just received, you know, let's say I've got, let's just do it like this. And then this will be the last thing we talk about today. And then we'll bring this to a close. You say, okay, I've got uh, neighbor one, neighbor two, and neighbor three. And here's me right here. And I've got this main uh, BGP table where anytime they send me something, it goes into my main BGP table. And then from my main BGP table, it may or may not end up in my routing table. And they said, here's my problem, is that you know every once in a while, I'm changing my policy. You know, I'm changing my route maps, I'm introducing a new filter list, you know, whatever, maybe on a particular neighbor, like neighbor three. And as we've talked about, and this is for inbound maybe, my inbound policy. And as we've talked about, you know, I can, I can manipulate my inbound route maps and my inbound filtering all day long, but once I hit the enter key and I apply that new inbound policy, it does not take effect against what's already in my BGP table. It only takes effect if this neighbor resends me his stuff. Because it'll, when he resends me his stuff, now it'll run through my new policy. And so people said, well, you know, it's a hassle to try to get a hold of the network administrator for neighbor number three, get that person to log into router number three and then resend all of his routes to me. You know, you could be on the phone all day long finding the person who can actually do that. They said, well, this is how they thought a long time ago. They said, here's what we could do. <clears throat> Why don't we do this? When our neighbors send me their stuff, rather than just dumping it all into the BGP table, why don't we use a little bit more memory in my router and create like these, I just call them shadow tables. That's not a technical term or anything. So when router one sends me his stuff, it's gonna, I've got a special table just for his routes. I got a special table for just for router two, and a special table for just for router three, and then, all those routes will go here into the main BGP table. And so now on my router, once I implement my new inbound policy for router three, I can say clear IP BGP, let's say router three is three, 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 soft in. What that'll do is it doesn't send any messages to router three. Router three is not involved at all. What it does is I will take all the routes here in the shadow copy table, and I will take those routes and run those routes through my new BGP policy, which will then end up influencing my BGP table. This was called soft reconfiguration, where your neighbor, you applied soft reconfiguration against selective neighbors. So you didn't have to do it against all of your neighbors. Maybe I just do it just against router three. But whatever neighbor you applied soft reconfiguration against, you are now consuming twice the memory because all the, all the stuff he sent you was put in like a, a shadow table here and then it was also dumped into your main BGP table. But the benefit to this was now, if I ever need to change my policy, 
I wouldn't have to get router three on the phone and get him to do anything. I could just take the routes I had in a shadow table here and run it through my new policy. But people start realizing, wow, but if, if my neighbors are sending me tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of routes, this router's gonna have to have a lot of memory to not only store all those routes in the main BGB table, but in these like shadow soft reconfiguration tables as well. That's why they came out with route refresh. They said, now all I gotta do is send you a little message called a route refresh request, and you'll resend me all of your routes. I don't have to store duplicate copies of them in a soft reconfiguration table for that purpose. So that's sort of like the difference between soft reconfiguration and route refresh. All right, so everybody, that concludes what we are talking about today. I really appreciate everybody uh, joining us in the webinar today. I hope this was a, a useful and good learning experience for you. And uh, stay tuned for future webinars. As a matter of fact, in, in a few weeks coming up, another great instructor here at, at INE, Tracy Wallace and I, will be doing a joint webinar talking about how you network Cisco gear into an Azure virtual cloud. And we'll talk about that. So I'd stay tuned for that as well. So thank you everybody for watching and thank you for joining the show.